that will bring me to the other uh, targets. Uh, Marty, we mentioned at the beginning what the minimal workup to be done. And now we talk about IDH1, IDH2 mutation. How prevalent these mutations are? Overall, between IDH1 and IDH2, it's about 20 to 22 percent of patients. About 15 okay. percent IDH2 and about 8 or so okay. percent of IDH1. And then these tests are done across the world, across the nation, or like just only on specific labs. You have to have specialized lab to be done. Well, it has to be done either in a specialized lab, but there are um, uh, panels that can be sent, uh, commercial panels that can yeah. be sent, such as Foundation Medicine, for example. And the test reported, uh, you read a report, it's a quantitative or qualitative? You have a level of? Uh, qualitative. Qualitative today. And then based on these mutations, so we have IDH1 and 2 inhibitors present last year from your institution at MD Anderson and other centers as well. Can you update us on what what is the state of the art of these drugs today? Well, I think IDH uh, uh, inhibitors are actually one of the most exciting novel agents that uh, are being studied at the moment. Um, in general, in the relapsed refractory setting in AML and other hematologic malignancies in a phase one and phase two uh, trial, the overall response rate is about 40 percent and the complete remission rate is about 20 percent. So uh, that's very exciting to have an oral, bioavailable, relatively non-toxic pill uh, with a complete remission rate in AML, relapse and refractory AML of 20% we think is quite exciting. Also exciting and quite provocative is the mechanism of action which has been suggested to possibly represent differentiation, Correct. reminiscent of ATRA in APL. And I think in the early stage of the trial where you start the medication and you have the white cone going up and some investigators did drop the patient because quote unquote progression and then later on there was a differentiation and patient responded. It's possible that may be part of the natural history of the response okay. as it is in atra, with atra and arsenic where you see a, some differentiation, you see leukocytosis that eventually resolves. But these are single agent and you mentioned activity as a single agent oral pills but just what is the past for the future? to combine them in elderly people, young people, what combination to get an approval eventually? Well, I think there are a lot of studies being done. A study that's, one of the studies I think is most important that's currently uh, available at a number of institutions is combining IDH1 and 2 inhibitors with induction chemotherapy, donorubicin and cytarabine, in previously untreated patients. And I think that's, uh, we're anxious to see those results. Uh, and uh, can I just ask Dr. Talman a question? So. Uh, there's also trials, by the way, of course, using low-dose therapy plus the uh, IDH1 and IDH2 inhibitors. But let's say uh, either the IDH, let's say the IDH2 inhibitor is available next year because it gets approval based on the re wonderful results you just mentioned in the outback patients. You've got a patient who's uh, 45 years old with relapsed AML with an IDH mutation, IDH2 mutation. Will you give them chemotherapy or will you give them an IDH2 inhibitor as a bridge to the transplant? As first? Uh... First relapse. I think uh, that kind of study has to be done to help guide us. I think it isn't clear. If, certainly if they fail one reinduction attempt, then I would quickly move to an IDH inhibitor. But you, know, you move it in combination with, let's say the drug is available, you give it single agent monotherapy or you combine it with RSC base or well, Vidaza. Those studies have to be done today in someone that has failed a first induction attempt, reinduction attempt. Someone relapses, they get the chemotherapy program. Are, are, if they're certainly younger, our inclination today, uh, because it's not uh, commercially available, would to be administer a, a cycle of chemotherapy and then after first, re after first attempt at reinduction, they still have persistent disease, then we would give monotherapy. So How do you have I, I agree with Marty, what Marty started with. I, I think um, uh, AG120 uh, and uh, 221, the IDH1 uh, and 2 inhibitors, are the most exciting drugs that I've seen in AML. But I think we, we really need to learn something that's critically important to which patients are benefiting. Because what's different about these drugs compared to FLT3 inhibitors is that they don't inhibit the native IDH1 and 2. That would, that would lead to no energy production in cells since that's important in the Krebs cycle. And they're very, very specific. And, and we only see like a 20% complete remission rate. But in those complete remitters, Donardo at this uh, Congress is going to show that you can actually show clearance of the mutation, which has not often been done with other inhibitors. But the issue is, who are these patients? I would imagine that these are patients whose disease is being driven by IDH1 or IDH2. And by turning that off, you can really get at the biology of the disease. 
Now the problem with foundation one and panels like that, you don't get the variant allelic frequency yes. of that. And, and, and what you do get though, are the other mutations that are present. I'm gonna guess for the future that the patients who have the best responses are the ones who have more simple mutational profiles um, that are dr where IDH1 and 2 is, is driving the disease. So what I'll finish with is my concern about the way that we have been developing these drugs. If we go about planning the next set of phase three studies of chemo, either HMA or intensive chemo plus or minus these drugs and take everyone with an IDH1 and IDH2 mutation and hope to see a benefit in terms of survival, we may be um, uh, you know, uh, doomed to failure if only a small percentage of those patients actually have the disease driven and are de okay. deriving benefit. So Mark, uh, we have the IDH1 and IDH2 and we have two compounds. Can we combine them in the rationale to combine these two drugs? Combining IDH1 and IDH2 yes. inhibitors. Um, it's just I'll be honest, I'm not sure. I mean, remember the, the uh, AML uh, characterized by having an IDH1, IDH2, or a WT1 or TET2 is, they're almost mutually yes. exclusive, right? Yes. It's a complementation group. I, one or two are mutually exclusive. So you're not going to okay. see them together. Okay.